I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we're your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley to talk all about William Grant Still's Afro-American Symphony. There is so much to enjoy when it comes to this work, like how Still delicately balances blues idioms and orchestration, his use of non-standard instruments at the time like vibraphone and banjo, and an intriguing quote in the music you'll probably recognize right away. This is a remarkable symphony, one that gets better, I think, the more that you listen because there's just there's just so many interesting lines that you can pick up on each time. And we also did a full episode all about the life and music of William Grant Still. It's episode number 52, so I highly recommend checking out that episode, too. But like many great symphonies that you hear and read about, Evan, it sounds like this one did not really get an easy start. In fact, we have some diary evidence from him as well. Right. We think that he may have started working on the Afro-American Symphony as early as 1924, but we know from his diary that he actually did most of the work composing it starting on October 30th in 1930, and then he finished it a few weeks later in early December. And uh, his October 30th uh, diary entry says, Start working on Afro-American Symphony. Things look dark. I pray for strength that I may do just as God would have me. And uh, he goes on through the weeks, uh, you know, really kind of struggling, but also expressing this great devotion to God and this great uh, faith in what he's trying to accomplish by writing this symphony. And on December 6th, he writes uh, that he's completed scoring the third movement. And uh, December 26th, he writes the symphony is progressing rapidly. So uh, clearly he uh, was able to overcome in the struggle. I also like from a diary entry from that October 30th saying, I must not lose faith. I must not complain. He had this resolve, but it definitely wasn't an, um, an easy start for him. I think really doing anything. The first step is always the hardest uh, in, in doing yes. anything. And despite his initial struggle, this turned into a pretty crucial turning point in Still's career and led to a number of firsts. There, um, One is the first African-American to compose a symphony that was performed by a prominent orchestra. That was this symphony with the Rochester Philharmonic and Howard Hansen conducting the premiere in 1931. He would be the first African-American to conduct a major American orchestra, the L.A. Phil, in 1936, and also the first African-American to conduct a major American orchestra in the Deep South, the New Orleans Philharmonic in 1955. I know there's a lot of, there's other um, context to these dates, but um, you can't deny it's truly uh, a big moment here for William Grant Still and also music by African-American composers. Yes, he's clearly a pioneer, uh, both as a composer and a performer on a number of levels. And looking at the title of this um, symphony, Afro-American, with context, that was a term used for African-American, I believe, in the later 1800s and the first part of the 20th century. But it's not something I really hear anywhere else other than in this symphony today. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the language is always evolving through the generations. And uh, as we uh, hear these quotes from Still in today's episode, we'll hear language that evokes an earlier era. And one of those quotes is, and thankfully we have a lot of direct quotes from him, is um, this one here. I wanted to prove conclusively that the Negro musical idiom is an important part of the world's musical culture. That was the reason I decided to create a musical theme in the blues idiom and develop it into the highest of musical forms, the symphony. And this is a reason, Evan, that I think the symphony should be celebrated way more than we already uh, like it. And that is his unique use of blues idioms because Still was not just familiar. He was a big arranger of blues charts for W.C. Handy, who published the first ones in like the 19 teens. And the blues were very different, weren't they, at this point in the 20th century, the 1920s, for instance. Very different from the um, blues and the commercials in the 90s for um, for beer that I remember. <laughs> yes. I mean, like every musical genre, it's an evolving uh, medium. We're not really sure, you know, when the blues starts, uh, how you exactly define it. Uh, is a is a complex thing, but uh, as we as we explore this symphony, we'll really see the influence of the blues very clearly. As still working on this piece, uh, we have the diary entries and sketchbooks. And in one of his sketchbooks, he writes, "I harbor no delusions. 
as to the triviality of the blues, the secular folk music of the American Negro, despite their lowly origin and the homely sentiment of their texts, the pathos of their melodic content bespeaks the anguish of human hearts and belies the banality of their lyrics. And we hear in this uh, still one of the fascinating things about William Grant still is the many worlds that he inhabits uh, as a composer, as a performer, as an American, and uh, this dichotomy between different styles of music and the ways in which one group of musicians might look down on another group of musicians and their music. And uh, he's aware that in the quote-unquote classical music world, however we define that, there may be some attitudes about African-American musical idioms like the blues that are disparaging and uh, still is recognizing the, the complexities of that and these reflections that he, he, he understands on some level that there's uh, uh, there's a different level of musicality involved in the two styles, but he's also seeking to fuse them and does so quite brilliantly in this symphony. He absolutely does. I like how you describe that. And also we have a, a quote here for more context from a theologian, James H. Cohn, who said, the blues are secular spirituals. The spirituals are intensely religious, and the blues are just as intensely worldly. He continued later, The spirituals are slave songs, and they deal with historical realities that are pre-Civil War. They were created and sung by the group. The blues, while having some pre-Civil War roots, are essentially post-Civil War in consciousness. They reflect experiences that issued from emancipation, the Reconstruction period, and segregation laws. And that is, I think, a great distinction here of the um, spiritual growth into the into the blues and what it's reflecting, these experiences from emancipation, reconstruction, and segregation in Jim Crow. And getting into the first movement, I guess the question is, well, how did Still achieve this balance of using blues idioms? He said, the harmonies employed in the symphony are quite conventional, except in a few places. The use of this style of harmonization was necessary in order to attain simplicity and to intensify in the music those qualities which enable the hearers to recognize it as Negro music. The orchestration was planned with a view to the attainment of effective simplicity. And I think that's exactly what Still has accomplished here, because he also wrote in the 1920s a um, very modern style. He studied with Edgar Varese. But when you pair the blues idioms in a style or as an aesthetic that seeks to remove identity, well, you lose all those aspects that we've mentioned so far in the, um, in the blues. So right from the start in the movement, which is titled Longing, we hear these aspects. It starts with the call on the English horn, and then the trumpet right away introduces the blues theme here that the whole symphony is based on. And the trumpet is using a mute here, Evan, that I think most are probably unfamiliar with because it's not used in symphonic music too much. That is the Harmon mute, which is a very metallic-y sound. Basically, it's cutting off the sound from the bell and forcing it through a tube into a small opening. And it's very it's used very much in blues, big band, and jazz, especially later, think Miles Davis. Right. And, uh, you know, for music nerds like you and me, John, we uh, may look at the uh, technical aspects, but even someone unfamiliar with these distinctions uh, would hear the sound mm -hmm. and recognize it as like, this is not a sound I usually hear in a, you know, a piece by Stravinsky or Brahms. This is a, a big band or a jazz kind of a sound. What are some other ways, Evan, that he's bringing in blues qualities, idioms here? Well, again, you know, we have these terms for different musical genres and they're often nebulous, but there are certain characteristics of the blues that are very relevant to this piece. And we also find them in other music that's described that way. The lowered third and seventh scale degrees on the blues scale. Uh, we hear that in the melodic structure. Uh, call and response, uh, you know, there's a musical phrase and then, then there's another musical phrase that answers it. really hear that a lot in this symphony uh 12 bar harmonic pattern it's like a, the 12 bar blues uh and again if you're if people that even people that aren't familiar with the musical terms that we might be using would recognize the sound of a 12 bar blues harmonic progression and you really hear that a lot uh, especially in this first movement of still symphony <laughs> 
guests because I think we're so used to eight bar and 16 bar sections or phrases and being in 12, it just, it makes things, it changes the foundation and the, just the overall feeling of it, um, of it a bit. And the way he's using those lower thirds and, and, and sevenths, the blue notes that make up that, that blue scale, it comes across so much more clearly when it's sparse and done in this way, as opposed to, I don't know, kind of a big band on stage, a rich, thickly textured orchestration, it would lose it there. And we've got some swing rhythms, too. Um, when the trumpet plays that blues theme, they're using a swing rhythm as opposed to just um, what, we, what, what we would call straight eighth notes. One particular moment that I really love, Evan, is this moment where the lower strings are playing this rhythm, ba-dum, da-dum, and then basically the timpani and bass clarinet have the same rhythm, too, but they're offset a bit, and it gives us interesting movement to, in, in the music, almost like you're being um, not pushed around, pushed around by waves, maybe. It's very um, undulating, and it's underneath um, the melody. And right after this, there's that great call and response that you were just describing, and the sparse orchestration makes those idioms clear. And later on, a similar moment with the bass clarinet, again, sparse in its um, what's happening around it. And I think that's what emphasizes this longing quality. It reminds me of a quote that we just read from Still, who said, The pathos of their melodic content bespeaks the anguish of human hearts. He's getting that across here, the way that he's um, using these idioms with the sparseness around them. And the work is very theatrical, too. You mentioned uh, W.C. Handy, someone that Still had worked with early in his career. U.B. Blake is another luminary of that tradition that Still knew and worked with. And you have these very sort of theatrical moments. There's this passage in this first movement. Uh, really sounds like a, like a, a scene from a musical. And you, you really hear the, him evoking that theatrical style. This is also similar to and different from what Gershwin was doing with Paul Whiteman's orchestra and Rhapsody in Blue. And Gershwin and Still were very aware of each other. You look at uh, the ways in which Gershwin is fusing a jazz idiom with classical forms in Rhapsody in Blue, whereas Still is drawing not from jazz, but from the blues. And of course, there's overlap between blues and jazz, but the characteristics that we mentioned earlier, like the 12-bar harmonic pattern, that's really a blues thing much more than a jazz thing, and you don't really hear that in the Gershwin. Uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue is uh, all symphonic in scoring, but not in form. It's a rhapsody, as the title tells us. Still's work is very much in the tradition of the four-movement symphony going all the way back to Franz Josef Haydn in the mid-18th century. It's also tempting to think about a bigger picture. Gershwin is maybe trying to say in Rhapsody in Blue that jazz can be high art, which was a pretty radical position at the time the piece was written. But the emotional scope of Rhapsody in Blue is much more limited, I think. Uh, it's a fun piece. It's really classy. It's, it's cool. But uh, I think that Still is really trying to say something much more uh, powerful in the Afro-American symphony. But both pieces, uh, both Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue and the still Afro-American symphony are taking a black musical idiom and merging it with one that is historically European, the, the symphonic forms. And in this fusion, we have this new and dynamic art that coming is coming into existence. And the premiere went quite uh, well, didn't it? Um, as we said, possibly the first symphony by a black composer to be played by a major American orchestra with the Rochester Phil uh, led by Dr. Howard Hansen in 1931. And he also brought it over to Europe, didn't he? Yes. Well, Hansen was a great supporter of Still and uh, really a musician, a composer, a conductor who wanted to break these barriers. Howard Hansen brought the Still's Afro-American Symphony to German orchestras in Berlin and Stuttgart and Leipzig. And uh, there's even reports of performances in those venues where the audience was uh, really very receptive, which is fascinating to think about what's going on in Germany in the early 1930s, a terrifying time. Uh, but clearly not uh, monolithic if people were so receptive to this music. They even wanted to hear an encore of the third movement of the symphony in some instances. So very well received. And something we haven't mentioned yet is that he also included excerpts of poems into um, the music as well. 
and they're poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. They are in his uh, vernacular poems. And so we'll include those on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. But the fourth one isn't is one of his vernacular poems, and we'll hear a little bit of that later. But in terms of a program, a story through the symphony, still did not have one when he was writing, but shortly came up with one afterwards. But he later uh, wrote this in regards to that. He said, At the time it was written, no thought was given to a program for the Afro-American symphony, the program being added after the completion of the work. I have regretted this step because in this particular instance, a program is decidedly inadequate. The program devised at that time stated that the music portrayed the sons of the soil, that is, that it offered a composite musical portrait of those Afro-Americans who have not responded completely to the cultural influences of today. It's true an interpretation of that sort may be read into the music. He continues later with this, Unquestionably, various other interpretations may be read into the music. Each movement of this symphony presents a definite emotion Excerpts from poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar being included in the score for the purpose of explaining these emotions. Each movement has a suggestive title. The first is Longing, the second, Sorrow, the third, or Scherzo, Humor, and then the fourth, Sincerity. And more on that as we get to the fourth movement. But he also continues, In it I have stressed an original original motif in the blues idiom employed as the principal theme of the first movement, and appearing in various forms in the succeeding movements, where I have tried to present it in a characteristic manner. Very, very descriptive um, here. He's giving us a lot of detail, uh, still that is, into um, his thinking of this, and also later saying, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have um, done it that way. But longing for the first movement, that comes across quite clear in the music. It's program music, and it isn't program music. You know, he's not, it's not telling a very specific story. But it is, as, as you were just uh, sharing in that quote, expressing very specific emotions. And he wants to bring us into that world, maybe without uh, very specifically defining the parameters of those feelings. And the first movement, which has that longing quality, I love how it transitions into the second movement, sorrow, because there's definitely a through line here in how he's bringing everything down. Um, into the first movement and then bringing everything back up into the second with that change of emotion it um yeah it shows you they're they're on the same side of a coin maybe or, or on opposite sides of a coin or a cube or whatever longing and sorrow that is yeah and uh the sorrow in this movement is expressed almost with a sweetness you know it's not the sorrow of like a you know, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony or something. This is a different way. It's, it's not this wailing, teeth gnashing sorrow. And the call and response between the strings and the woodwinds at the very beginning of the movement, and then you have these call and response duets in the woodwinds themselves, uh, uh, are definitely the blue, a blues characteristic. Although, of course, you also find call and response in the spirituals tradition. One moment I love in this second movement and I think showcases all the qualities we've been talking about still, it's his inclusion of the vibraphone, which did not even really exist until like 15 years before it was invented. It's an instrument that almost everyone associates pretty closely with jazz. And this is one of the first, if not maybe the first, maybe inclusions of vibraphone in classical music in a symphony, for example. And he uses it very, very sparsely. I love how he does it because using the characteristics of the instrument to bring out color very sparsely. And what I mean by that is it's oftentimes just a very simple triad that the vibraphone hits. And then the vibraphone being made of metal bars instead of wood like a marimba really rings out in the hall. And as it rings, the other lines can kind of grow out in front of it. It just creates a whole new color with using it so little. And he does this with a number of different instruments throughout the piece. There's uh, wood blocks in one particular point, but you don't hear them frequently in the piece. There's a banjo in the third movement. Uh, doesn't appear anywhere else in the entire piece. Just a few measures here and there. The harp kind of uh, has a little, a few moments here and there. But again, using it sparsely to create a very specific uh, sound color palette that's so evocative and and just he really knows the sound that he wants and he's able to convey that with this he has a very very high level of skill in his orchestration throughout the piece <laughs> 
Thank you for mentioning harp because I love how he uses it too. It is different. I can't quite put my finger on it, but the way he uses harp is very different from what we hear the harp usually being used for in a symphony. Um, yeah, it is sparse. It does create some nice transitions, but um, I don't know. It's something to listen for. It does sound a bit different to me. And the end is interesting here too. I know you've uh, noted about how the end, there's, in, there's instructions he's giving to musicians. Written in the score, the very end of the second movement, uh, it's just the strings playing an F major chord, and it says, Il più piano possible, as soft as possible. Uh, all, the, all of the instructions are in the traditional Italian language uh, vocabulary of musical notation in an orchestral score. But there's also the Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem that goes with this movement, the sorrow that it's is expressing, is a sorrow for, it's a longing for death. It's a longing to be rid of this life. And I almost wonder if what we're hearing in this last chord, as soft as possible, is actually dying away. So we dedicated this to uh, a friend, Irving Zvirke. Tell us about this, because it was out of the ordinary for still to dedicate this to a living person. He didn't often dedicate scores to living persons, so that in and of itself is really noteworthy. Irving Schwerke was a music critic. Uh, he was also an impresario. He arranged performances, uh, including a performance of this uh, still symphony in France in 1933. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Schwerke and Still had a long correspondence. They never actually met in person, as far as we know. But we do know that Schwerke was a staunch advocate of Stills' music, like I said, uh, arranging that performance in France, for example. And uh, in their correspondence, Still uh, writes uh, very personally to this, really regarding him as a friend, as a, a confidant. This is one of, uh, in 1931, Still wrote to Schwerke, it is unfortunate for a man of color who is ambitious to live in America. True, and I gladly admit it, there are many splendid people here, broad-minded, unselfish, judging a man from the standpoint of his worth rather than his color. Such a man as Dr. Howard Hansen, Frank Patterson, many others. Such a man as my friend Verez proved to be when he was here. But there is a preponderance of those who are exactly the opposite. I've never felt this so keenly as in the past few months. Friends who would lend me a helping hand, who would make it possible for me to make a living for my family, are unable to do anything because of those who are opposed to placing a colored man in any position of prominence. That is stating it mildly. Unless there is a change soon, I will be forced to abandon my aspirations and look to other means of gaining a livelihood or to go where such conditions do not exist. That's quite extraordinary, Evan, reading that letter to Schwerke, a, a, a person he um, worked with and trusted, although he never met, as you, as you said, just the, the stark realities that still is facing. And that there's the, the anguish of the, the injustice that, that he's confronted with and knowing that it's not just his burden to bear, but that there's a whole society that is arranged in this very unfair way is a theme throughout his music and throughout his life. That transition you uh, beautifully described before, going from the second movement, goes so well into the third movement, which is titled Humor. So let's play the opening of this real quick. Pay attention, everyone, to the horns when they come in after a short introduction. So I think, Evan, for many people, the horn line there, that's pretty clearly a tune that um, I think everyone knows. I got rhythm, I got music. Yes. So what's what's going on there? Yes. Uh, that's a fascinating question. And so a question is, well, what exactly is happening here? Did Gershwin write this first and still took it or still came up with this first and, and, and Gershwin wrote it? Because they, they kind of came out around the same time. I Got Rhythm comes from a show that Gershwin came out with in October of 1930, which was the time that Still was writing this. But that tune, I Got Rhythm, is actually very similar to a lot of the melodies that he was still was working on in the 1920s. And it sounds like he would have been noodling and working on that little line 
in many places where Gershwin might have heard it. I've read many stories and accounts of different shows and places where people said Still was kind of noodling with this, and then someone heard Gershwin and said, hey, didn't you write that Still? Uh, a lot of maybe ambiguity around um, the source of that. Yes, uh, I think this is one of those mysteries we'll never solve. It's interesting to note that, uh, you know, if in fact Gershwin had stolen this music from Still, Still had his entire life to say so, and he never did make that claim. So I'm almost more inclined to wonder if what we see here, this is more like a friendly inside joke between two composers. We don't know which one of them came up with the phrase first. Like you said, it's it's fun to have this image of Still noodling at the piano and, and Gershwin hearing it, or even vice versa. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting to think about uh, Charles William Latshaw, who is a conductor who wrote uh, in 2014, he wrote his doctoral dissertation for uh, Indiana University, and he uh, came up with a new score of the symphony and also wrote about the symphony. And he addresses this very specifically and says, um, was this quote meant to immediately evoke a showbiz sound? Is this a sarcastic jab at Gershwin? Did Gershwin steal this melody from Still, or is it the other way around? Still has never made any claim one way or the other on this matter, but it seems clear the inclusion of this two-measure quote is intentional on Still's part. What his intent was behind the quote remains a mystery. So that's what uh, Dr. Latshaw had to say about this after having researched it extensively. It's uh, maybe a sophisticated way of saying, we don't really know, so let's just enjoy it. I like that. A sophisticated way to say, I don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> In my overactive imagination, it goes like this. Still is noodling around on this maybe before Shuffle Along, a show that Gershwin saw. Not a fully formed idea or anything, but maybe Gershwin heard it, and then that turned into I Got Rhythm. We know Still was writing something around this idea, and including it here in a direct quote to me, it sounds like, if you think in baseball terms, he's not throwing a ball behind the batter getting ejected and then having a benching bench clear uh, fight, but rather he's throwing a fastball high and inside enough to send a message. Hey, yeah, I, now I know that, you know, that I know that maybe I thought of that first, maybe something like yeah. that. I like yeah. that. There's, it has a good natured feel to it from where I sit, but I could be misinterpreting it. And again, we will never know for sure. And whatever the answer may be, it's uh, indicative of the uh, many worlds that's still inhabited. One of the many things that makes him such a fascinating figure. He's in the world of classical music. He's in the world of showbiz. He's in the world of the blues. He's inhabiting the white world and the black world. And it also gives us a look into the the wide emotional range of this symphony, this, this sorrow that's longing for death in the second movement, and then this extraordinary delight in life that makes joking and laughter as a form of worship in the third movement. And we, you were mentioning earlier James Cone writing about how the spirituals are the music of the slavery period, whereas the blues music represents the post-Reconstruction era of Jim Crow, but also of, of advancing freedoms. And Still's choice of writing the symphony in a blues idiom without much of any reference to the spirituals tradition is a very deliberate choice. And this is especially conspicuous in the third movement. When you look at the uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem that goes with this movement, it's about worship. It's about uh, people engaging in worship. And so there's this embodied spirituality, especially in this third movement, without evoking the spirituals that would have evoked, that would have been a part of that worship. So it's a fascinating puzzle that you have this still writing in this diary, praying to God to give him strength to write this symphony, very pious, and yet he would refer to the title of this, symph of this movement is Humor. Uh, and yet it's evoking this worship experience and using humor to to do it. And that's why I think repeated listens only make this better with time. You start to hear these um, qualities. One thing I love about this movement is the inclusion of the banjo. It's on the backbeat, it's adding style, uh, danceability, you can't help but move to it. And, of course, this style led to some of the most popular musical forms in American history of the 20th century. Now, 
I know Still had said to um, someone else, I think it was in France, maybe it was another country, they were writing saying, hey, do we need banjo? Because we don't have any banjo people, right? Hard to no. find a banjo player right. in an orchestra, yes. Yes. So then Still said, you can omit it. That's okay. It's for um, local flavor, I think is what he said. But today, I think that would not happen at all. The banjo would be included because every big city with an orchestra has someone that plays banjo now. I've played here and abroad with different orchestras and groups, and we've had banjo. Um, and and um, far-reaching places, you don't quite expect it. You can certainly play this movement without the banjo, but it just adds something. That there, there's no other way to capture that sound. And, no. Uh, omitting it really is, uh, even if it's a practical necessity, it's, I think it's a loss. Yes, and I love how the banjo is also part of driving the end, getting faster and faster, almost like in a Tchaikovsky Trepak dance kind of way. <laughs> I thought of more of Tchaikovsky recently listening to this. I don't know why. Well, there you mentioned a danceability. And uh, one of the things that's fascinating about the symphony is that there's this very sort of vocal cantabile. You, know, you have this blues idiom throughout. And you really can hear the blues being sung. But in this third movement, we're dancing. And I can't help but think of the, the juba that Florence Price included in all of her symphonies, which is a dance, traditional black American dance. Uh, and both in that case and in, in this still symphony, in the place of a Beethovenian scherzo, there's something distinctly African-American that goes into these symphonies, Florence Price or William Grant Still. The scherzo, of course, Beethoven derived from the menuetto. You look at the symphonies of Mozart and Haydn. The third movement is often a minuet, uh, which is a dance movement. And it's one of the last vestiges of the Baroque dance suite, which is a... A, uh, uh, an ancestor of the symphony. So we have this singing quality throughout Still's Afro-American symphony, but really dancing in the third movement. And we'll get to the finale in just a moment right after this. Okay, so we're getting into the finale now of the symphony. And as we mentioned, Still included excerpts of poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The fourth one is not one of his, one of his vernacular ones. Tell us about this one, Evan. Right. So the first three poems for the first three movements are in the dialect. And then the fourth movement uh, has this poem by Dunbar, which is not written in dialect. And the tempo marking for this movement is lento con risoluzione, slowly with resolve. And the Dunbar poem for this fourth movement, the final movement, is this. Be proud, my race, in mind and soul. Thy name is writ on glory's scroll in characters of fire. High mid the clouds of fame's bright sky, thy banner's blazoned folds now fly, and truth shall lift them higher. So you have this very uh, exalted poetical style in, in the poetry that goes with this movement of the symphony, uh, and a, a more sort of, a, you might say, a more universal voice rather than the very uh, specific time and place evoked by the dialect in the other poems. And this, this tempo marking slowly with resolve, lento con risoluzione, I would argue this is the most serious part of the whole symphony. Mm -hmm. This, uh, Especially this opening of the fourth movement conveys hope, it conveys struggle, it conveys determination, there's this gravitas, but also there's this just incredibly heartbreaking lyrical beauty. And this to me, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so tempting to read into it, but to me I hear the music of communal self-respect. This is a music of self-love. Mm -hmm. It is a tremendously beautiful opening and very strikingly different than what we've heard so far, maybe emphasizing those um, same qualities that you just talked about. And you even talked about, uh, you know, the uh, use of the harmon mute in uh, earlier movements and that uh, evoking that jazz or big band sound. Whereas Going into this fourth movement, we hear the muted trumpets, but with the cup mute that is much more typical of orchestral writing. This is a point where, that I think can get lost on non-musicians, still is writing for various mutes for these brass players. And one of the things that composers often get wrong is using mutes. They don't understand the color or they don't understand how long it takes to put one in or take one out, and especially not understanding the color or the variety of sounds that you can get with just one mute. Still, on the other hand, was um, 
very familiar and aware with all of these things that you need to be. So in, with the Harmon Mute in the opening one, it's very metallic-y sounding, um, made famous again by Miles Davis later on. The Cup Mute is a little bit different because instead of the sound coming through a little hole in that mute, it's coming through, but then there's basically this kind of cup shape on the end, which bounces the sound back. And it gives it kind of a more dusty, softer timbre, not soft and um, dynamic, but softer and kind of its edges of the sound. Sort of a vernacular for the Harmon mute is the wah-wah mute. And you yes. that wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah, that, yeah. that, that, that evoking that style. And the cup mute is, like I said, more... Or, yeah, like you said, composers don't always understand mutes. They often will just say consordini in the score with a mute, but they don't say which mute to use. Mm -hmm. And still didn't make that mistake because he had so much experience as a performer and uh, knew so many musicians. And he really studied these particular issues and really wanted to get a very particular kind of sound. And his masterful orchestration reflects that deep thinking about uh, a different uh, sound palette. Yes, yes. The standard mute they would use is a straight mute. It would not come across here the same way as using the ones that um, that still um, mentions. So we also have just more of that great sparse orchestration and harmony that we talked about with still that really emphasizes these blues idiom moments. And as the blues theme comes back in later in this movement, it seems to also drive it forward, which was before kind of a not a lazy, but more of a sauntering da um in the rhythm now starts to change and pick up more momentum and drive the music forward, which I think is just, um, it's just one of those interesting things that, again, you hear more of when you listen to it more. And you also hear the ways in which he's really fusing blues with a symphonic classical idiom, more so in this movement, I think, than in the others. Uh, obviously throughout the whole piece, but he really uh, blends these different styles in this finale very powerfully. There's this one moment where you have these tritone relationships, these two very unrelated chords sounding side by side. In a way that's very much not characteristic of the blues, uh, blues harmonic progression. Uh, and you really wonder about the ultra-modern influences like composer like Edgar, Edgar Varese that still knew and worked with uh, and the extent to which he's drawing. It's a, almost a Stravinskyan kind of quality to the sound. A moment I particularly love that he's doing. I'm biased. I play tuba, of course, but it's what he's doing with tuba in the opening. He could have given the tuba a much less moving line, more in line with what the trombones are doing, which is what almost every composer, uh, which most composers do in symphonic music. But instead, he's having the tuba play what the string basses are playing, just down an octave. And it's a moving line that is um, quite long. It's um, probably quite challenging in managing breath and um, sustaining and direction. But it's just something that is different that gives it a whole different sound than if it was just block chords in the brass with the moving line and the strings it's actually it reminds me more of um prokofiev-esque or cesar franc-esque in his writing of using the bass and the tuba together like that against what other brass players are doing and again yet another example it's a, it's a wonderful example john and one of many of how still really understands the sound that he wants and he's able to create these really exceptional like we, you know, we don't often hear the tuba doubling the string basses, uh, as you said, and so it's a, it's an unusual sound, and it's it's like the exactly the sound that you wouldn't have expected, and when you do hear it, it's exactly the way it should have been. Yes. Now, Evan, tell us about the ending here, because we can also mention that the name here is different than what I said in the very very um in much earlier where I was talking about uh, quoting still. I think he said. The fourth movement is titled Sincerity, but Aspiration is actually what's on the score now. That was a change, wasn't it? So the, the symphony, of course, as we said, was completed in 1930, and then he revised it in 1969. And one of the changes, he, he made some changes to the orchestration, uh, some of which are not enormously consequential, a few of which are pretty interesting. But one of the things he did change that I think is really significant is he changes the title of the fourth movement 
Sincerity being the original title and then later changing that to Aspiration. As we were quoting him earlier, he was really at pains to point out, well, there isn't really a specific program here, but then why would he have changed the title of the movement? And why would he make the change that he made? So I I wonder if there's almost an ambivalence on Still's part. He's, He's not sure how much he wants to say with words about the music that he's created. Clearly, he wants to say something. Uh, He wants to share some words about it. But also, the music speaks for itself in ways that words can't quite define. But to talk about aspiration, and that again, the tempo marking, con risoluzione, with resolve, and that Dunbar poem that reflects this indomitable pride in uh, in the community's identity, the pride of being a black American, uh, and how beautifully Still's music conveys that. Uh, certainly what he had to say about it is, is very powerful, but the music itself really conveys this, this sense of, to me, the sense of indomitable, unconquerable striving. As I think we can all tell, this is quite a symphony with so much happening under the surface. A lot of stuff that you don't need to know to enjoy the music, but... Knowing it also enhances it and can give you different perspectives. I love listening to recordings and trying to listen from a different perspective, not each time, but when I want to listen to it from a different perspective, because you really can hear things differently. And a lot of the qualities and things you mentioned can also be found in a a similar way. So it's quite a symphony. Don't let this be the only time that you hear it. Definitely um, search out. We'll have recordings on the show notes page as well. But it didn't quite end here to either, um, Evan. There was another symphony that he wrote that had a tie-in with this one. Still intended his G minor symphony to be a sequel to the Afro-American symphony. And what he had to say about the G minor symphony, what, here's a quote from Still. The symphony in G minor is related to my Afro-American symphony, being in fact a sort of extension or evolution of it. This relationship is implied musically through the affinity of the principal theme of the first movement of the symphony in G minor to the principal theme of the fourth or last movement of the Afro-American. So still is, 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 is explaining to us by saying this how the ending of the Afro-American symphony is linked very specifically in terms of musical themes to the beginning of the symphony in G minor. And he goes on to say, the Afro-American symphony represented the Negro of days not far removed from the Civil War. The symphony in G minor represents the American colored man of today. In so many instances, a totally new individual produced through the fusion of white, Indian, and Negro bloods. And this is uh, yet another instance of the ways in which Still is very proud to draw from different influences and different backgrounds and different traditions, not only musically, but culturally and socially and even spiritually. In 1964, Still said about the Afro-American Symphony, I think there are a wide range of interpretations that could be read into it. I really had no program in mind. I wanted, above all, to write music that would be recognizable as being in the idiom employed or recognized, I should say, as that of the American Negro. It was the object that I desired most of all. It sounds like Still really achieved the things he was searching out to achieve. And I love that line. It was the object that I desired most of all. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for joining me to talk all about this symphony. I think we can all listen to this now with fresh or renewed ears. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send me questions and episode ideas to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a review in your podcast app and share it with a friend. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical. Classical.